Um, before I'll go to um, start the sermon, let me just remind you that the main time in a week that we have heard from the Lord is when we gather together to study His Word. Uh, our daily Bible reading will supplement, um, and we hear the Lord through our individual reading, but the Lord in a week's time will speak to His people in no other way than when His Word is preached on the service. And that's why very, very important. If we are a community, we all hear from God's Word. Um, when we are gathered together. And so we are now on uh, verses 1 and 2. And sorry to hear this, but this is just part 1 today. Um, I will just touch on one verse, and that's verse 1. And we will have a part 2 next week, Okay. I hope it's okay. And it's a big question. I think it's a big question of how we employees uh, who are bound to, of course, uh, do what the companies have asked us to do. And I say bound but free. I'm not saying we're slaves. But even though we're not slaves today, they are, there are things we are bound to do, right? If you are an employee, you cannot just skip work and live without absence. You lose your work. And so there are things, there are responsibilities that sometimes can feel, um, can be enslaving. Uh, we, we still feel at times that we are trapped um, in work for whatever reason. We cannot leave work because we have families to feed. We cannot leave work because we're paid big, although we do not really like our boss. Right? We cannot leave work because sometimes because God doesn't want you to leave. And so sometimes work can be, we can feel that, that we are trapped in work. So how, how then can we exercise our Christian freedom in that picture? Because we are supposed to live our Christian freedom. We're supposed to be free people, if you may. And that's what I would want to talk uh, today, right? Who among us here, sometimes you, you felt like I just have no other option. If only I have a place to go, if only I can find another work, or if only I can just be paid as big as I am paid today, I would have left. See, we're, again, we're not slaves like those, like the ones who Paul instructed in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. That's not our context. But somehow many of us, again, still felt trapped in our work. And the last thing sometimes that comes into our mind when it comes to work is freedom. Work and freedom doesn't go together. <laughs> sometimes work and freedom do not go together. Burden? Yes. Or freedom? Hell no. I'm counting every minute. I am, I am at work. It is for this reason that we entitle our sermon today, A Christian Employee, Bound But Free. Bound But Free. Paul wrote to Timothy, again, primarily for the gospel. First Timothy is all about the gospel. I hope that at this point you would realize this is all about the gospel. Chapter 1, it is about protecting the gospel. Chapter 2, it's about effective witnessing of the gospel. Chapter 3, it's about raising qualified leaders who can protect the gospel and its testimony. Chapter 4, it is an instruction to Timothy to be a good pastor, a pastor that God wants him to be so that he can lead the people to godliness. And of course, chapter 5, down to chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Timothy, or Paul, instructed Timothy how to honor God to care basically for, or sorry, to honor people or to care for different people in the church so that nothing can be said against the gospel, right? So that nothing can be said 
against the gospel. Particularly here in chapter 6, verses 1 to 2a, there's a portion of chapter 6 that belongs to verse 3 down, when it says there, teach and urge these things. So chapter 6, verses verse 1 and 2a, he also gave instructions for the slaves. And I like it. Because slaves are part of the church. They are believers of Christ. Maybe in, in the community, slaves at the time were low in rank, but not in the church. They are as <clears throat> important as everyone in, in the church. And so Paul also gave instruction to the slaves. In a way, um, this is also Paul's way to show care for slaves instead of just neglecting them, again, because of their status, but probably because of tendencies of slaves to hate their masters. Diba? Parang kung ikaw slave at the time, ay prone ka to abuses because you are, you are seen as a thing. You can even be sold. I don't have money today. Today you say, I don't have money. Can I have any jewelry to pawn? I don't have money today. Which of these slaves I will sell? That's how low the rank was at the time. But again, in Christ, they have equal worth. That's why Paul, remember, had to send Timothy back, sorry, Onesimus back to Philemon. Because if, if these slaves will run away and they will not work well, uh, they will destroy their testimonies. Or they might be seen as not a true uh, believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul focused on how to protect them, not to fall to this tendency by instructing them to respect and give prof- proper service to their, to their masters. Right? But Paul exactly knew that this, these slaves were bound to their masters. A thing, again, that can easily make a Christian slave, parang left without a choice, fell trapped. And under normal circumstances, think with me for a moment, if we go back there, and that was the state of uh, a slave. If think of me, I think a slave at the time when he thinks of freedom, freedom means freedom from slavery. Right? Freedom from slavery. It's like us today. I want freedom. I'm so burdened by this work. And freedom means resignation. <laughs> that's, that's, that's freedom. But that's not what freedom is. Now, Paul is reminding these Christian slaves what Christian freedom is. And it is radically different from the idea of freedom in this world. Paul expected his slaves to exercise their freedom by working to honor God. By working to honor God, that's your freedom. That's Christian freedom. Not to work for money, not to work for anyone else, but to work for God. That's Christian freedom. Reflected by how we honor our masters, and how we give good service. So here's our main idea as we unpack this text today and next week. A Christian employee should work to honor God that he might freely honor his superiors. They might be gentle, they might be unjust, but we will be free to serve them well and be of good service to them. That's real Christian freedom. Again, real Christian freedom is to do everything to honor God. And if you are today doing everything to honor God, then you're free. So here's our outline today and next week. First point is working to honor God frees a Christian employee to honor his superior. That's the only thing we can touch today. And for children in the church, your word today is honor. Okay, your word today is honor. And the second one, which we will be talking next week, working to honor God, frees a Christian employee to choose to be. It's a choice. I could have said to be of good service, but I want to emphasize that it's a choice. 
when we're working. A Christian employee to choose to be of good service to his superiors. And children, this is for next week. But your word next week will be uh, service. Service. So we will touch on that next week. We'll only touch on the first one today. Working to honor God frees a Christian employee to honor his superiors. Before anything else, this passage is uh, primarily concerned. Notice carefully, this is primarily concerned of our motivation in working. Uh, what is our work motivation? What motivates you in work? I'm pretty sure we will surely have a wide range of answer to that question. My motivation for work is that I have a child, and since I had this child, I was just pumped up. I just want to work because I want to make sure that his future is secure. You know, when I was a young when I was a young child, I was deprived by anything. And my motivation to work is to change that picture. I just want to be able to buy what I wanted to buy, which I was deprived when I was young. All this time, we were never really looked up by the community. And I'm working hard so that I can gain a position and change that how people looked at me. But unless God's glory is the primary motivation for these Christian slaves and for us employees today, we will never understand this exhortation of Paul. How would you understand when Paul said, regard them worthy of all honor? You know, when this boss shouts at you, when, when, when this boss is mean, when you have been in the company for 10 years and, and you are not even raised, your salary has not even been raised even a thousand. How can I regard my boss worthy of all honor? We could not understand unless we realize that we are working for the glory of God. We will never consistently honor our bosses, but selectively honor. Right? What well, well, Paul thinks here is that you are consistent. And the only way for that is to work for the glory of God. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1, it reads again. Let all who are under a yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching and the gospel may not be revealed. See, when a Christian truly lived for the name of God and the gospel, there is no situation in life that he can not turn it to be for God. Paul here expected that these Christian slaves will show high respect to their masters for the purpose of honoring the name of God and the gospel. Now, we should... Be careful to equate slaves here to that of contemporary employees working like you, working for your employers. Very different context. In fact, we are not talking about an office here or a place of work. We are talking about a household. This is on the context of a household. The master here could be the father in the family. And the family here could be rich and they have slaves. It is in that context that Paul admonished bond servants to regard their masters as worthy of all honor. These slaves could have, maybe their parents, not, not even them, maybe their parents have, have, have made a huge debt and they could no longer pay. And so they and their parents were made to be slaves. That was the culture back then. It's, it's evil when we look at it that way. But that was their culture. It was an acceptable thing uh, during the time. But although we are not slaves today, the principles here are very much applicable to us. In fact, I would say that the, the, the way we approach chapter 6 here, verses 1 and 2, is, is how much more us. 
If Paul said to these, to these slaves that they have to do this, how much more us today who are employees, not slaves, and you are paid well? Right? We are paid well. Sometimes when we are in Starbucks, the, the topic of our conversation is our boss. And many times, these are not good things. I wonder if we do that, are we honoring our earthly masters? Are we seeing them worthy of all respect? Let's bow down our heads and let's repent and we'll close in prayer. Well, they might not have seen as slavery or slavery at that time might not have been seen as an evil thing because it was the culture of their time. Paul even again sent Onesimus, a runaway slave. So Paul, if Paul looked at it, the slavery is evil in itself. Remember that in the Old Testament, God even gave an instruction on how to deal with slaves. But the history of the world had shown some heroic movement to end slavery, isn't it? Martin Luther King Jr., he was fighting for that. If it happened today, it would surely be seen as uh, hindi makatao. Even if it was not seen as evil back then, it does not change the fact that these slaves were the lowest of rank in the community and were treated as things, again, who can be sold. One thing for sure, a slave would have wanted to get out of slavery. Like, Paul, don't tell me to submit to my master. Don't tell me to regard my master as worthy of all honor. Tell me, Paul, how I can get out of slavery. We haven't even mentioned yet here, at least for Paul, we, he did not even mention if, if their masters were unjust or just. And, and if you remember the second Peter, first Peter chapter one, chapter two, verse 18 to 25, the one that I read in our pastoral prayer, Peter even had to instruct his readers, these Christian slaves, to honor even the unjust. To honor even the unjust. So it is not surprising if slaves were seen back then as a thing that masters owned. Freedom of, from their masters would have, been, would have meant getting out of slavery. Get out of debt. Baka naman may next of kin ka pa. Meron kang mahihiraman ng pera. Meron kang kamag-anak na maawa sa'yo and you give the money. Pay your debt. Pack up your things. Stay as far as you can from your master. And now you're free. Though Paul did not mention about exercising you're exercising Christian freedom here. His exhortation in verses 1 and 2, if you try to look at it, truly resembles a Christian freedom. Christian freedom means a freedom to do things no longer so that we will measure up, but to do things to please the Lord who justified us. That's Christian freedom. And we're supposed to live that way. We're supposed not to be dictated by the things that are done to us. We are free to do what God has called us to do. That's Christian freedom. That's your birthright. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 and verse 6, for example, says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not again Submit, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Do not do things again to be approved. In the context of religious mind, verse 6, For in Christ, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. But here's what counts. Only faith working through love. This is Christian freedom. Christian freedom is doing things out of faith to honor the Lord and love for others. 
Christian freedom is doing things out of faith to honor the Lord and love others. <laughs> That's Christian freedom. Are you living in freedom, your freedom? You know? Jesus said, if, if someone throw you a stone, throw a bread. That's Christian freedom. You're not dictated by people. Some of us still continue to be dictated by what has been done to us. Some of us, we are living our lives and we never even understand that the way we live our lives was still shaped by how we have been hurt and how we have been betrayed. And some of us fail to freely do what pleases the Lord. When this happened, if this is, if this is how we work in our workplace, nakasiman mo tayo always, kasi we feel like there is an, things are unfair. In one way or another, we are allowing things to imprison or yoke us instead of freely living the life that Christ purchased for us. Brother, magpatawad ka na. Brother, tapos na yun. Ang tagal na nun eh. Ten years, pero kung pag-usapan mo, parang kahapon lang eh. Yung pa rin nagdidikta ng buhay natin many times, hindi po ba? And when this happened, hindi po ba, napa, hindi po ba natin napapansin na ito yung mga bagay na pumipigil sa atin para gawin ng anumang pinapagawa sa atin ng Panginoon. We are not supposed to be dictated by these things. But what the Lord has done for us. Are you living because of what Jesus has done for us? And this is exactly at the back of mind of Paul, especially here in verse 1. Notice the paradox. Notice yung dalawang bagay na pinag-isa ni Paul that are not supposed to be one. Clearly, when he said all means believers, particularly believing slaves, and Paul would have to say, tell them about, pinagdidiinan pa naman ni Paul yung, yung kanilang status. You are under a yoke. All of you are under, a, under the yoke. Bond servants. It means they were under an authority, to say the least. And actually the picture is that they were powerless against this. They were powerless against this authority over them. Buti pa tayo, pwede tayo mag-resign. <laughs> Buti sana kung ang slave na hirapan na, he will go to his master and say, here's my resignation letter. They were actually powerless. They don't have that right. They were bound to do what their master's called to do. And if you quickly peep on or turn your, the pages of your scripture in Luke 17, 7 to 10, Jesus said there that the glory of the slave is to do his duty. However, instead of hating their masters or seeing their masters as the one who enslaved them, that they were supposed to be free from them, Paul said that they have to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. Can, can you see that these two things supposedly should not go together? An anong sinabi mo, Pastor? I have to regard my boss as worthy of all honor. Do you know my boss? Well, let me say this first. Even employees today who are well paid have a hard time regarding their superiors worthy of all honor. Much more the slaves back then. How can Paul... How could Paul ask these Christian slaves to regard their masters worthy of all honor? Pakang ibig mo sabihin, Paul, bear with them. Hayaan mo na lang yan. Christian ka naman eh. Just endure, tiisin mo na lang, brother. Alam mo naman, yung endurance produces character and character will make you mature. Pagpasensyaan mo na lang, be patient. Another, another virtue na gusto nang i-develop ng Panginoon sa'yo, just, just show virtue. 
That might be the right thing to say, Paul, but regard them as worthy of all honor. What is happening here? And is this even possible? It's good that we answer these questions because it will help us understand how to live our Christian freedom in our workplace. I hope that after this sermon, uh, there would be less um, counseling on itong boss ko, pastor. Pakipray naman ng imprecatory prayer. Na, joke. Which at times could be the last place we want to be for whatever reason. Some of us felt trapped because we want to leave the work. Again, but we do not know where to go. Some of us could not leave our work because that's the only thing we know what we know to do. But freedom, again, freedom might be the last, la- you are here and you were saying freedom is the last description. I want to describe the way I work. It's more like trapped, discontented, and unhappy. How can we live our Christian freedom in work? And let me point two things um, from the text to answer the question, how can we live our Christian freedom in work? First, and while this might not solve everything yet, but here's the first one. Honor here is directed towards the delegated authority of, of, of people over us. It's a delegated authority. No one has an inherent authority but God. And every authority is a delegated authority from God. All people has authority over you. Ultimately, it is the authority of the Lord. Know this carefully, that Paul did not mention whether their masters were evil or good, but that they were their masters. And people, Paul... For Paul, probably, he was thinking, regardless of your master. Well, Peter says, even the unjust. But Peter does not have to, Paul did not have to say the, the good, the gentle, and the unjust. Because it is implied when he said, your masters, implied whatever your master is, what kind of master you have. Regard them worthy of all honor. Well, generally speaking, if you look at Scripture, Scripture calls believers to honor, to know how to honor authorities. Do you know that this is one of the things that will separate us from the world? By nature, all of us are rebellious. We don't want authority over us. Our children do not want authority. They do not want, they're not naturally inclined to say, yay, I have authority over me. And it's probably the reason you're more happy when the pastor is not there. But <laughs> elsewhere, Paul commanded the Roman believers to submit to the government. And we know the Roman government. It was not a good government. But they are supposed to submit to that. Romans 13, 1 to 4. And you remember that what Paul, how Paul explained. He said, because they are ministers of God. The, the, the government that we have, they are servants of God to punish evil and to reward good. And if you're saying uh, our, our government is not displaying that one, let me tell you this one. It's still better to have a bad government than to have no government at all. We also know that wives are, commit, are commanded to submit to the authority that God puts over them. Their husbands. And I've been thinking for a while, why did Paul start with the hu- wife and not with the husband? If, if it is the husband who is supposed to have the greater um, responsibility, would it be right to give your instruction first to the husband? Why would you give it to the wife? And, and I don't know, I would ask Paul, this is a conjecture. In other words, in this in a sabion, but I feel like it, this is a safe conjecture. But Paul is saying, regardless of your husband, do this. Submit. All authority then is the Lord's. All authority is the Lord's. Then, ultimately, every authority over us is from the Lord. 
They, they are to protect us. They are to keep us. Because when there is no authority, when the, mouth, when the cut is away, the mouse will play. Learning to honor authority then is ultimately learning to submit to the authority of the Lord. When we learn how to submit to author any authority which is against our flesh, here's the beauty of this church, and I hope we will capture this one, because it shows a heart that has been changed and regenerated. So that when we see authority, we no longer shun it. No, parang, parang dati pag nagdadrive ka, may, may, may MD, MMDA, bakit ka natatakot sa MMDA? And then sabi ng ways, a police is ahead. And you're like, oh, there's a police, I should turn left. Why are we afraid of authority? When our, when our hearts have been changed and regenerated, authority is for us, not against us. And we see it as an opportunity to show our love for and submission to God. It is for this reason that while showing their respect, clearly when Paul said, let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, it, it surely implied that you work well, render good service. Verse 2, that's what, that's what Paul said. But here, when he said regard, he's talking about the mind. To change your mind, to, to change your view, to change the way you see authority. Paul said you, you should regard them. If before, takot na takot ka sa master mo. To now, change your mind and see them as worthy, deserving of all honor. How? How can their master be worthy of respect when it is the last thing they are worthy of? Understanding by understanding that all authority belongs to God. All authority, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's not just for missions. He's really saying, all authority is mine. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. When a right authority is over us, we can be sure that the ultimate source of it is God. And think about it. If you know that God wants you to do that, then regardless of your superior, regardless of what kind of master you have, You'll see them as worthy of all honor because that is a delegated authority. It is not an inherent authority. That is a delegated authority. And the one who delegated that authority is God. The, the only source of authority. Isn't it, isn't it the reason why we sin against God when we have rebellious spirit against an authority? Maybe it be our bosses, our parents, or our government. If my children would be rebellious and would not submit to the authority God gave me, I don't just say to them, you violated my authority. I would tell them, you sinned against God. Because this is not my authority only. This is God's authority. But there you go, church. The way to honor your bosses. Some of you have to report tomorrow and ask for forgiveness from your boss. Understand that their authority is delegated authority, meaning give, given by the one who has all inherent authority. What this Paul is saying here is, is this, see God beyond your boss. You know, you need to see God beyond your boss. I think this is the right time to jump into the next thing on how we can live our Christian freedom in work from verse 1. And here it is. Honoring authorities, that of our bosses, owners of company, over us, is honoring God. 
it is honoring God. Listen to what Paul again said in verse 1. Let all who are under a yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching may not be revealed. The name of God and the testimony of the gospel are things that are most important to every believer. And as an employee or a slave in Paul's time, it is not an exception. Like, yeah, this is for the glory of God. This is mission, of course. No, work is not an exception. When it comes to work, it is not supposed to be the salary. Suddenly, the main motivation, the reason why we're there is just salary, career, success. Not even family, as important as these things. It is the name of God and the testimony of the gospel. Now think about it, how revolutionary it is. Think of how revolutionary it is when you go to work and you are thinking, how am I going to display the gospel today? It revolutionized the way we work. Christians, is, Christians are supposed to be the best employees because we have the greater reason. We have the perfect reason how, why we should work well. Cruciform Life Church. I hope none of us would say we could not hear like, oh, see, nasa cruciform pala yan? Presidente ng union namin yun eh. <clears throat> Paul's exhortation here would only make sense if it were not or would never make sense if it were not for the glory of God and the gospel. If, if it is just family, you would tell your family, you would tell your husband, it's so hard already. You will tell your, your wife, so hard already. I'm, I'm degraded in the, it, it's not worth it. Let me find another work. If it is just salary, if things will be so hard already, it's just salary, I can find it somewhere else. But what if God wants you to stay in that company because he wants you to display the gospel? There is a reason to stay. So I will understand if it is for another reason, but see your master as worthy of all honor. Somehow Paul was reminding these Christian slaves that they are no longer living for themselves, but for God. Let me remind you, church, you're no longer living for yourself. We are no longer living for ourselves. It's not worth it. You are living for God. We are living for the gospel. And if it is for the gospel, then, then we are now making sure that the name of God and the testimony of the gospel will not be mocked and will not be reviled. We will now understand that even if we will mess, that if we will mess up, it will no longer just be our name which will be revealed. We understand that it is the name of God that is at stake. It is the name of God that will be put to shame. It is the truthfulness of the gospel that will be in question. We know that when people mock the gospel instead of believing it, a thing that every Christian believer longs to see, people to see the gospel. People will understand the gospel and we are mirrors of the gospel so that the people will see the gospel through our lives. But what if we become the very wall that keeps them from seeing Christ? We have lost our saltiness. And if we have lost our saltiness, then we are good for nothing but be trampled. <clears throat> yes, they might have an abusive 
master. But they cannot allow the abuses of their master to shape the kind of slave they will be. Paul said, no. But what shape the kind of slave that you will be is who God is and what he has done for you through Jesus Christ. This is true freedom, church, isn't it? Throw everything in me. I'll continue to be good. I'll continue to aspire excellence because I'm not doing this because you're just. I'm not doing this because you're good. I'm doing this because my Lord and Master have shown me goodness in, in ways that I could never repay Him. Freedom was not running away from their master. Freedom was, was serving their master to honor their Lord. Is, not, is, it, is this not true to us Christian employees today? Now we can still have joy in our work because we do it not because of our boss is good, our employers is, are good, but because many times because many times they are not, but because God is good and we only seek to glorify God and display the gospel. Have you ever thought, again, how radical is this thing? If you will take this seriously, do you know how radical is this? Di ba, kung gugulatin mo sila, gulatin mo sila in this way. Not yung gulatin mo sila ng resignation letter mo. Pinagalitan ka. Google, latin ko yung boss ko bukas. First thing in the morning, you will see my resignation. When bo your boss is, is, ang sinasabi dito ni Paul, when your boss is not good, gulatin mo sila by showing goodness. How liberating it is. And I want to read again 1 Peter chapter 2, 18 to 25. This is, this is freedom at its best. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. That's freedom. For this is gracious thing when mindful of God, there's your freedom, you're mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are bitten for it, you endure? Butinga. Uh, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And why is it so? Verse 21, for this you have been called. This is your calling. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Then follow his footsteps. What is this footstep of Christ? Let me spell it out. Or Peter spelled it out. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. He, so he's saying, are you talking about injustice? A sin is done for you, you? Let me say to you this one. This Christ committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth, by the way. However, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He, when, he, when he suffered, he did not threaten them with resignation. but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. There you go. When we suffer things, continue to entrust yourself to God. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. Can you do this? Can you absorb the sin as well as you dis of others as you display, as you try to display the gospel of Jesus Christ? Bear the sin of the people, not, not that you pay. <laughs> Bear the pain. And whatever discomfort and suffering that it might bring you in his body on the tree that we might die to sin. Look at that. And live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. He's saying, if you remember that the gospel of Christ has healed you, has made you whole again before God, then there is no reason, there is no reason why you shouldn't allow yourself to suffer injustice if only that you will display the gospel of Christ. We reflect the gospel not when we work well because our superiors are good. 
You don't have to be a Christian to work well when your boss is good. We reflect the gospel when despite of how awful our bosses might be, we show the same love that we receive from Christ despite of our own awfulness. When we do things for the glory of God and the testimony of the gospel, the awfulness of our bosses become an opportunity. It becomes an opportunity to display the beauty of Christ. Christ who was able to love not just because we are awful, but because even when we are sinful, he loved us. Therefore, working to honor the Lord frees us to honor our bosses. I was blessed by the testimony of one of us who was clearly shown unfairness in a lot of things in the workplace. For the most part, the salary given to him, considering the volume and importance given to him, is just very, very low. When I was talking to this person, I was tempted to just look at the, if, he was, if, if he was well compensated. But we were trying to see if the Lord still have a hand or still have a work for him in the company. <clears throat> and then I began to hear from him how he was just on the corner, but the, the bosses saw what the things that he did. And though yung time na yun, hindi pa ni-raise yung kanyang salary, he was actually starting to enjoy favor from his bosses. And then we, I said, I know that your salary is too low in comparison to your work. You're not well compensated. But would you please stay in your work? Because I see the work of the Lord. And I can remember how he responded to that. And he said, I would gladly stay because I will not destroy the testimony that God is doing in my life. And by the way, two weeks after that one, his salary was raised. I am not saying just endure your boss and your salary will be raised. That's not what we're saying here. You see, our freedom is to do what is proper before the Lord. That's our freedom. Let me quickly read Luke 17, verse 7 to 10, and then I will jump to our implication very quickly, and we're done. Luke 17, 7 to 10. The context is when the disciples said, Lord, help us to forgive our brothers to come to us, who will come to us and ask for forgiveness over and over again. And along that line, Jesus said this. We're not talking about forgiveness, but just the heart of this parable. Luke 17, 7. Will any of you who a servant, a servant plowing or keeping sheep, say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he rather not say to him, prepare supper for me first, dress properly, and serve me while I drink and eat. And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have all you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Here are four implications. First, we cannot afford to forget that we work for the Lord. If you are an employee, you cannot afford that you are working for the Lord. Remind yourself daily. See God beyond your bosses. Secondly, we cannot let the treatment of our superiors to shape the kind of employees we will be. Suerte naman nila, sila yung magdidikta sa buhay natin. Sino ba sila para idikta yung buhay natin, isn't it? Christ is more priceless and let Christ shape the way we work. Thirdly, we have to always be motivated by who God is and what Jesus has done for us in the way we work. That's supposed to be the way we motivate ourselves. 
And lastly, we should be free to respect our superiors as a reflection of our freedom in Christ.